Hello. Is that focused? It is, yes. Um, I'd like to start this video by saying I've accumulated um, a reasonably large audience on YouTube. Um, a lot of comments have, have been, well not actually that many comments, but some comments have been uh, about the many grammatical mistakes I've made in Old English in previous videos, some of which were um, made long before I was uh, popular, um, and some of which have been made since, um, some of which have been made quite recently. Um, and I'm I'm obviously not an expert in Old English, and I shouldn't be taken as a some kind of supreme authority on it. Um, that's very important to bear in mind. My my interest lies mostly with the pronunciation. Um, so with the reconstruction videos I did, the main purpose of that was to present the the visceral experience of listening to um, Old English from the perspective of somebody that doesn't understand it, uh, and the experience of listening to a new language from the perspective of a non-speaker um, is largely. I think is largely, it comes from the phonology and from the phonetic realisations of words. Um, so the grammar was not my main focus there, um, and I made, a, you know, almost every sentence had a mistake in it. The word order was not um, perfect by a long way. I made a lot of mistakes in uh, um, things like case endings and things like that, um, and in gender, and I've been um, making mistakes recently as well. Um, what I thought I would do in an attempt to sort of atone for that is to provide um, a basic um, guide to the grammar of Old English in terms of cases and gender, um, just for those of you who are interested in that side of things. Now, this isn't something I would talk about very often, um, because as I say, um, I'm, not, I'm clearly not, not confident enough with the grammar, the syntax, to make any sort of authoritative statements on it, and I don't want to be making statements that... Um, that that turn out to be wrong. Um, but I'll make this video to sort of talk people through the grammar of it if they want if they want that side of things. Um, and as for the next Baldrick video, um, which is in the writing stage at the moment, obviously it's going to be on hold for a bit, um, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, but I will release a document alongside it um, detailing uh, the various reasons that I've capped certain religions in from other languages and things like that from modern English. Um, it will have a script, it will have a, um, a breakdown of the pronunciation and the word order, um, and it will be available for people to sort of pick through and comment on. And then afterwards I'll release a video um, correcting some of the mistakes I will inevitably make, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make mistakes, you know. Um, it was a comment by um, someone called Sam Ish that led me to add this disclaimer, so thank you to him or her for that. Um, but also to everybody else who's commented um, about um, grammatical mistakes I've made. Um, this should be more of a sort of community thing than a, um, a kind of cult personality thing where people sort of blindly believe the things I say. You know, it should be a sort of discussion where we correct each other if, if mistakes are made. Um, from now on I'll, I'll try and make a habit of putting a corrections to mistakes in the description if people correct me um, and I think it's legitimate or if uh, um, I notice a mistake I've made I'll, I'll put it in the description. Um, so yes. Now grammatical gender is something we're all probably aware of um, plenty of European languages have it, but if we've, if, if we've never learnt one of those languages, we might not understand what it is. Um, so grammatical gender has almost nothing to do with the social idea of gender. So a piece of clothing normally worn by women, for example, could have masculine grammatical gender. The social gender associations of an object have no relation to what grammatical gender it carries. All grammatical gender is, is a system of classifying nouns. So Old English had three grammatical genders, and those were masculine, feminine, and neuter. Now, what does that mean for a noun to have a particular grammatical gender? Well, the grammatical gender of a noun has an effect on the definite article it takes, um, which is to say which version of the word the you stick in front of it. It has an effect on the adjectives used to describe the noun, and it has an effect on the pronouns used for that noun. So let's start with the first one, the definite article. The word the had many different forms in Old English, and you'd use a different version of the definite article depending on the noun it was attached to. So in modern English, you'd just say the cat, the goat, the cattle. In old English, you'd say se cat, se gat, sat fur. Annoyingly, just like in German, there's usually nothing about the word that tells you what gender it is. So you just have to know. The second thing 
the gender of a noun affects the adjectives you use to describe that noun. So you have to add a particular ending to an adjective depending on what gender the next noun is. So instead of the small cat, the small goat, the small cattle, it would be sismal cot, sil smolu got, that smal fil. The third thing, if you're referring back to a noun using a pronoun, like it in English, you'd go with its grammatical gender. So you'd call the cat he, the goat her, and the cattle it, or I suppose in modern English them in the case of cattle. This is something in particular that I always forget to do in Old English, um, and actually usually forget to do in German as well. Now, case is something we're all aware of, but if you've never learned a second language, again, chances are you're not exactly sure how it works. You might know the words, but not really know what they mean. Old English had four cases, the nominative, accusative, dative and genitive. The nominative and accusative are the easiest to explain, so the nominative case applies to the subject, by which I mean the thing in the sentence that's doing an action. The accusative applies to the object, the thing in the sentence having an action done to it. So in English, apart from in the case of pronouns like he and she, we mark the nominative and the accusative using word order alone. So take the sentence, the cat bit the dog. Now switch it around, the dog bit the cat. Just switching the order of words changes the meaning completely, and that's because in modern English as a rule of thumb, in a simple sentence like this, the thing that's mentioned first is the subject, and it's in the nominative. The thing that's mentioned second is the object, and it's in the accusative. In Old English, word order was less stringent because case was indicated in the same way as gender was, by changing the definite article and adding endings to adjectives. So for the cat bit the dog, you'd say, se cot bart thone hund. For the dog bit the cat, you'd say, se hund bart thone cot. Now this is interesting because a lot of people notice that Old English was very complicated in a lot of ways, and they ask why has it become so simplified in modern English? And is this a general pattern, so the languages in general simplify over time? And the answer is generally that when languages get simpler in one way, they have to make up for it by getting more complicated in another way. So with this example, modern English doesn't have complicated case and gender markers, so to make up for it, it has to have a much more stringent word order. So in Old English, whether you said se hund bart thone cut or thone cut bart se hund, you'd be describing the same situation, a dog biting a cat, because you're telling the listener which one is doing the action, just using a different mechanism than we do in modern English. However, there were word orders which were more common and probably sounded more natural than others. The dative case and the genitive case are more complicated. So the dative involves an indirect object. And this is often the thing in the sentence being, um, I suppose, benefited by the action. So in English, I sent John the book. I is the subject because I'm sending the book, I'm doing the action. The book is the object because it's having the action of being sent being done to it. And John is the indirect object because he's benefiting from me sending the book. So an example from Old English, ich jauf than kotte sonne mitte. This would be a normal way of saying it, but if you were to say sonne mitte jauf ich than kotte, it would mean the same thing. The genitive is where the possessive in modern English comes from. So it indicates possession, but it also indicates a number of other things. Basically, in modern English, it's wherever you could appropriately use the word of or the possessive. So the capital of India, the child's toy, a piece of cake. Old English formed this in a way that will be familiar to modern German speakers. Se mitte thas kotis, or thas kotis mitte, the cat's food, the food of the cat. Now, gender and case go together. So each combination of gender and case has its own endings and its own definite article. So if you wanted to say the food of the goat, you'd say se mette tharigat, se mette tharigat. Thank you very much for watching this video, and I promise I'll come to you next time with something that's not just a load of slides.